someone who'll be known to many of you, conservative online commentator and the face of Turning Point Australia, Joel Jamal. Joel lives in uh, that area of Sydney. He's himself a Syrian, a Syrian, and he's an Assyrian. You'll know the difference in a moment if you don't already. Uh, and as I said, he is friends with Bishop Ma Mari. Joel and I spoke on Tuesday, so the day after the attack, and I started by asking him, what is an Assyrian and who identifies as Assyrian and what is this church? Yeah, sure. So look, I'm, I'm Syrian, but it can be a little bit lost on people. Um, Assyria is a, is an, is a kingdom uh, long now past, but it has a language, it has a people, it has a history. And it's sort of, uh, it's spread across like Syria, I think Iraq and a bit of Iran. Um, so it's kind of a large area. It's got its own language and everything. But um, the church that Bishop Maramari came from was called Christ the Good Shepherd Church. It's a lovely church, very suburban area in the southwest of Sydney. And it's an area that has a very strong ethnic population of varying different Middle Eastern religions, right. but also, also ethnicities as well. So, Joel, what's the story with the bishop? He, he was on the Patrick Bed Davis podcast recently, um, one of the biggest podcasts in America. He, he's quite a, a big name online in certain circles, right? Oh, he's huge. He's huge. The, the media and, and the, the, the government have no idea how big this man's reach is. I mean, we're talking in the hundreds, possibly billions of views online. Um, with regards to... It, it can't be reduced down to a single Facebook page. This man is clipped and then reclipped on so many different platforms out there on some of the biggest channels. Bishop Maramari is a man that is very much prominent in the community in Southwest Sydney as well. Of course, that's how he started. And he's someone that live streams all of his services online, which is why we came to see the horrific image of him being stabbed. But he's very much respected in the area, very loved in the area. I personally really got close to him during the pandemic. I saw some of his speeches online. Uh, I put some of his videos up and they ended up going viral. He's mm. one of the only priests in New South Wales during the pandemic that criticised the government. He didn't take government grants to open a jab clinic at his church, unlike many other religious institutions. He's someone that stood up against it, talked out against it, and um, he was very much rebuked because of it, but he stuck to his guns. And so now you can imagine a man that's respected in his community in that sense to see such a blatant attack. Right. His community had a naturally understandable, yeah. visceral reaction, which is what we saw last night. Okay, yeah. I mean, I can, I can understand the reaction, I guess, but I sure don't condone it, I've got to tell you. And uh, it was completely over the top. But help us to understand what sparked that reaction for those of us watching from outside. That was a very, very big group of people, mate that descended on that church very, very quickly? I think overwhelmingly the response was out of love and protection of someone that they respect. There is a lot of uh, existing um, wounds from the Middle East. You need to understand these are people that came from the Middle East, many of which knew people that were killed in religious wars, whether it was the Lebanese that had uh, massive wars over their last hundred years, including in the 70s, where they would be slaughtered by their neighbors, whether it was in Syria, where there, there were many Christians that were burned alive in cages, or even Assyrians as well. Yeah, it's complicated. And um, the amount of people in Southwest and Sydney that come from those war-torn countries, and they've come here for a better life to raise kids, you know, come under, you know, build the economy, build the country that make up the tradies of this country and have s supplied a lot of our missing skills that we, that we have and pay their taxes and actually contribute culturally. Um, these are some of the strongest members of our community. And so, yeah, there is a bit of a, there is a massive tension there that's obvious uh, between the Christians and the Muslims in the area. There's a massive ethnic population for both. But when it comes to the amount of um, love that was for this particular bishop and protection, I personally wanted to go to the church last night. I didn't know what to do. When I first heard the story, not only do I know the guy, but my, I felt compelled to go to that church. I didn't yeah. end up doing it because it's not practical. What are you going to do, Joel? Yeah. Well, I mean, I get the intensity of, of feeling for the bishop, right? I, get, I understand that. But... This stuff has just got absolutely no place in modern Australia. The violence was disgraceful. The attack on the police was completely unacceptable. 
Um, the hindering of the paramedics, man, that was just shocking. Uh, and I hope to throw the book at the perpetrators of that. I'm sure Bishop Marmari would not support what happened, and it's certainly not Christian behaviour. But these ethnic tensions from the homeland, they've got to be left in the homeland. There have been a lot of stories circulating about whether the attacker had their fingers chopped off uh, in retaliation. Um, I think police confirmed he'd lost a finger in the attack somehow, but haven't said exactly how. Uh, there are also stories, I understand, Joel, of possible uh, divine intervention. I think what happened from some first um, eyewitnesses that were there, they say that some of the initial stabs actually hit the cross that the bishop was holding up to protect himself. And it actually almost misfired the uh, knife mechanism. I'm not sure the name of the knife. And that's why you see during it, the attacker looked at it like, what's wrong? What's wrong with my knife? Why isn't it quite working? And I'm really, I mean, you know, praise God. The bishop is stable. He's doing well. He's in good spirits. But what was really moving was what happened right after that. The bishop stood up, blood coming out of his neck. He walked over to his would-be murderer and he said to him, my son, don't be afraid. You are forgiven. And he put his hand on his head. And he prayed for him. This, this is truly a, an amazing man. And to show that level of uh, forgiveness for someone that still wanted him dead in that moment, the kid was smiling at what he had done. He was proud of what he had done. There was no empathy. Mm. And to see that was insane. Now, this is not something Bishop Marmari would ever, would ever be supportive of, nor Jesus. And... What we saw after that was the police couldn't get the attacker out of the church. They were able to get Bishop Marmari and the others out. That was very easy. But they couldn't get the attacker out of the church. It was almost like a hostage situation. And when they'd finally cleared the church, when they'd finally gotten people out, outside, people were chanting to give him up, give him, hand him over to us, essentially. They thought they weren't sure what had happened to the bishop. And all they'd known was that there was this Muslim, a 15-year-old bloke had come and stabbed their bishop. And they were understandably very, very angry. And they started being very violent towards the police members. Which is completely unacceptable, as, as we've said. But you've mentioned to me earlier that the motive is not really to play out hostilities from the homeland, but to prevent those hostilities from happening here. Not sure I follow the logic of that, but I think I get your point. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, first off, as I've mentioned before, they've come from war-torn Middle East, and they've come to this country so that they didn't have to experience anything like this. So you can be damn sure that they're not going to want to see that happen over their dead body. And they don't want to live in in Australia where their bishops are attacked mid-mass, just blatantly. Mm. The other aspect is... Southwestern Sydney has a history. I covered this a year ago when a Belfield church had a crucifix smashed in front of it where people from the church were being provoked to fight these LGBT pro-trans activists there. We saw a similar situation during the pandemic. The 12 LGAs of concern were in Southwestern Sydney. They were targeted, whereas the eastern suburbs like Bondi they were open. Whereas in the Western suburbs, like Southwestern Sydney, like this suburb, we had helicopters going over the, 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 the parks. We had schools shut down. We had a higher police presence in a state that had the highest police number per capita. And the last aspect is this is the same people that voted against the voice and the same people that still had uh, voice-like policies rammed over them as well. The same people that voted against same-sex marriage in 2017, and yet that it was passed anyway by their own MPs. This is why people are upset. They feel like they're not being heard. They feel like the police and the politicians don't represent them, and the media class as well. This is what happens when people feel that they're unheard. It's like the, the pressure in a bottle. It's about to explode, but you're not releasing any of the pressure, which is through democracy, through voting through free and fair dialogue, not not this censorship that we see online and this media gang up 
on uh, on a bishop who's still fighting for his life. All right. So what is what is being heard look like then? Like you talk about, they need to be heard. What 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 do our community leaders need to be doing? As I said, there is a political and media establishment in this country that has designed the what the way democracy is done at the at the the polling booth and at the uh, uh, in the media in the discussion. It's in a way that it's kind of left people out. And when I see this, I see at the the right way to do democracy is at the polling booth and it is on the free to air um, channels that we see. But instead, what we see is not the views of Western Sydney expressed on the ABC uh, that receives a billion dollar of taxpayer money, many of which comes from Western Sydney. And it's this is what I'm talking about. It's I believe in freedom of speech. I believe people should have access to it. But these people aren't really getting access to that freedom of speech and the political process in southwestern Sydney. And as a result, we're seeing that in the numbers. I mean, 20 percent of people in Bankstown, there's an invalid vote rate of 20 percent. Wow. People just aren't engaging in the political process. I mean, this is nuts. Yeah. Well, Joel, it's been good to talk. Thanks again for your insights, mate. I noticed you're on a bright, shiny new set there. Do you want to tell us about your new podcast that's launching soon? Yeah, absolutely. Now, look, thanks for having me on. And uh, yep, it's The Ark. I did a similar show back in 2020, but this is about bringing Christians, Muslims and uh, Jews together. It's, a, it's about a story uh, that we all respect about Noah's Ark. It's about retaking the rainbow symbol that the LGBTQ crowd have uh, taken. And it's about refocusing our community on exactly the issues that are affecting us in Australia, whether it's digital ID, free speech online, um, what's going on with the phasing out of cash or even the tightening of financial services and people not being able to get their money out of the bank. It's about refocusing Aussies on what's happening on their home soil rather than what's happening 14,000 kilometres away yeah. in a country that they can't control. Yeah, mate. That sounds, well, that sounds like exactly what we need. And I don't think what we need is the safety commissioner coming in and saying, let's not have a discussion at all. Obviously, there's a pressure cooker thing going on. We've got to have a release valve. We need to have more dialogue, more communication, not less. And so I wish you all the best of luck with the, with the new show, mate. Joel Jamal there from Turning Point Australia and his new podcast coming up, The Ark.